Well, good day, everyone. I am Noé Lugas from the University of New Hampshire, and I'm very pleased to talk to you about the propagation and expansion of coronary mass ejection and the formation of the sheath regions. I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me to give this talk. So in addition to interaction with other solar wind structures and other coronary mass ejections, pretty much all coronary mass ejections intake two fundamental processes during the propagation. They expand. And you can see this very clearly from pretty much comparing the shape and size of coronary mass ejection when it's very close to the sun, you know, the sun is to scale, too much later when it's very major, when again the sun is to blood here. Obviously, they expand. In addition, they form a sheath region and or drive a shock. And when they reach one AU, when they reach Earth, the typical sheath size is about 0.08 AU, which is about 25% of the CME duration. Why do we care? Why should we care? Well, it's really a question of fundamental physics. Magnetic ejecta are large scale regions of low plasma beta, and they're pretty much our best observatory to study this very unique state of the plasma. Uh, and you can really directly measure with spacecraft, magnetic dominated, propagating and expanding plasma. Expansion really in itself relates to a number of phenomena, the conservation magnetic flux, the pressure balance with the solar wind, as well as the connection or okay, erosion. The sheath formation, I will talk at the end of this uh, talk, is really a unique combination of the expansion of the CME, propagation and accumulation. If for you fundamental physics is not what uh, bring the money at the end of the day, is also a lot of space for effect. In fact, if you want to be able to forecast the magnetic field strength inside the coronal ejection at 1 AU from spacecraft at 0 0.9, 0 0.8, or from the coronal magnetic field measurement, you need to know that's expanding, or it's going to decrease with distance. And the sheath we'll discuss is really what drive lots of fundamental um, interaction between the coronal mass ejection and the magnetosphere, specifically the radiation belt, uh, but also uh, other part of the magnetosphere. So let's talk about coronal mass ejection expansion. Uh, kind of mentioned this, there's two main school of thoughts uh, regarding what causes this expansion. Uh, it could be that the CME overexpanding, meaning that such a high magnetic pressure, total pressure, multi-magnetic, inside the coronal mass ejection that they pretty much overexpand. Or it could be that it's a pressure balance. As the CME propagates, the solar wind pressure, the total pressure of the solar wind is decreasing this distance. And so as the CME propagates, it's pretty much like a balloon moving up in the atmosphere, just expand to stay in equilibrium. How do we study this expansion? There are really pretty much four ways. Uh, we can go it globally with remote observations, which to really tell us about the CME size and develop with distance. We can do it locally with measurement of the speed inside of CME as it passes over the spacecraft. We can do it statistically with many measurement of various CMEs of various distances to see how the size, the magnetic field changes with distance. Or we can do it globally, which is comparing the same CME being measured at two places uh, in the uh, interplanetary space. And kind of problematically, there hasn't been that many studies comparing these four different approaches. Ideally, we'll like all of the approaches to give us the same idea of CME expansion. So we're gonna go them through them one by one. So CME expansion from remote observation. Well, especially with the major, with stereo since 2007, we can directly measure the size of coma ejection. However, there's some projection effects which are not necessarily very easy to quantify has been worked by Nel Savani, by myself, by Trezanivis Finchila, uh, looking at various ways to measure the size of the CME, and pretty much all case finding that the expansion, the size of the CME, uh, is less than linear with distance, typically on the order of 0 0.7, so distance 0 0.7. Uh, so we can also, as I said, measure the CME expansion locally. Uh, the basic idea is from Karen Bulaga from the very early 80s, and uh, that as the CME passes over the spacecraft, we can see a decreasing speed. 
And really, if you think about it, half of this size, half of the speed decrease is the expansion. So the front is increasing with an expansion speed, the back is moving away from the center with expansion speed. So this half of this difference from front to back is the expansion speed, shown by ONs here. And then you can develop magnetic field model that incorporates its expansion speed, which is what uh, Farrell Jeffers did in 1993. A step further, uh, you can actually develop a uh, dimensional parameter uh, which try to incorporate the fact that this expansion speed is going to depend on the same size, the same speed, faster CME expand faster, and also the distance where you measure uh, the CME. So you can develop this uh, zeta uh, dimensional parameter, which is the uh, expansion speed or the speed difference divided by uh, Pretty much the size of CME, Vc times delta t, divided by the, multiplied by the distance, divided by the center speed. And what you find here is that instead of having a very large range of delta v, you have a much smaller range of zeta around 0 0.8. Again, theoretically, this zeta uh, from study by uh, Gulison and Thompson 10 is found to be independent of the same size magnetic field speed and distance of the observation. So you create this dimension parameter that is, does not depend much on the same properties or where you make the measurement. A step further, this for unperturbed CMEs, zeta is the power of index of the size increase. So again, the 0 0.8 that we found from uh, remote sensing observation is actually corresponding very much to the 0 0.8 found here by Pascal de Mona in some 10 study. And at a flux conservation, as you see in expanding size, the magnetic field is decreasing by a factor of twice more than the size increase. Uh, if it doesn't, because there's no flux conservation, so as the flux gets added or flux gets eroded, you can see the work by Matija Dubovic on some 18 about this. And in fact, uh, in a recent study, uh, Meda Haddad compared the evolution of the size and the magnetic field of the size of in the inner sphere for two simulation, and uh, they found that there's no perfect agreement uh, and that it's corresponding to the situation of at the it with the erosion, the magnetic field decrease is faster than the size increase. So there's no conservation of flux. So we said there's four ways to uh, so this expansion. The third way is statistically. And really a lot of what we think we know about uh, coronal mass ejection is from statistics. Uh, so what happened here is that you look at different CMEs, measure different distances, and you put them all together in some pot. You assume that it pretty much is a single population of the multiple populations, they behave the same way. And so that if you have enough CMEs, whatever enough means, you're gonna have a global trend obtained from this. Uh, but Munch Fan using Helios data and uh, Voyager data first did this in uh, the 90s, uh, you expanded this to uh, more measurements in early 2005. And it's also people have done this with uh, Messenger and Venice Express, including uh, Simon Good, uh, Rekha Winslow, and Miho Janvier. And problematically, for planetary emission like Venice Express and Mercury, we don't have plasma measurements, so we cannot really get the same size. But we can get magnetic field strength, so measure the decrease of the magnetic field. What we find is that the uh, rate of increase in size is again from 0.8, whereas the rate of decrease in magnetic field is a bit steeper than expected. It's about a bit more than twice the increase, about minus 1.8 is kind of a typical value. Um, before going into this global way, I'm gonna actually go through an example of a recent CME we studied. Uh, so 2013, July 9 CME, and 2013 because 2012 CME, same date was actually a very well studied event. It's not the same one. Uh, it's actually the same one as the one that Mostel et al. studied in the space of Airbnb in 2018. It's a relatively slowish CME, very uh, centered to the disk, so well observed by the multi B and propagating towards Earth. It uh, impacted both messenger at about 0.45 AU and then uh, L1, so with an ACE. And uh, we did in this paper, a number of analysis trying to find what is the speed of the CME using remote sensing observation and constraint with arrival time and variable speed at one AU. 
uh, using drag-based model, among others, and pretty much find that the speed of the scene is very constant. So it's very much 550 km per second. So it's, in some sense, a relatively simple case, not too fast, and it's not experiencing rapid deceleration. As I mentioned, we have a material measurement at Mercury, but not plasma, and at Earth, we still have a full set of measurements. So here I'm showing the magnetic field strengths, BR, BT, and BN component, and for wind, the density and the velocity. Uh, we have very similar profile. So there's this clear BT going uh, uh, negative, uh, whereas there's a clear rotation of the BN component from north to south. So this is actually very clear, uh, very self-similar type uh, expansion. So what else can we do? Well, from this measurement 20 you can calculate this zeta parameter, the dimensional parameter, which is related to the expansion speed of the scene. We find it's about 0 0.7. Again, remember typical value is 0 0.8. So this is relatively typical within once in a uh, slightly on the small size. So this CME based on in situ measurement at 20 u seems to be expanding rather typically or maybe a bit slower than typical. However, one of the things I didn't mention about this thing is that it's very, very long. Uh, the ejecta at 20 u, depending exactly when you take the boundaries, but is on the order of 40 hours. That's almost twice longer than typical ejecta, about 24 hours. Um, and this happened already at Mercury, and Mercury is about 20 hours uh, long ejecta. Again, that's, that's more the duration of measure at 20 u than at, at 0.45 a usual. Uh, so we can actually, again, try to use this fact of two measurements and see what, how does the magnetic field decreases with the distance. Again, theoretically, this decrease of the magnetic field should be given by minus two theta. So it should be about minus 1.4. In fact, it's about minus 1.3 to minus 1.6. So this appears to be consistent with this idea of Demolin, Glissano, and Dasso that the size increase is related to somatic field decrease, and that zeta really gives you the true way of the semi change with time. However, we're left this kind of uh, weird finding that the semi, which is very, very long, very wide, is actually expanding slowly. So they bring it to the question: I mean, how comes the semi? which is expanding slowly is so big. I mean, either it's through, through extreme expansion before even hitting Mercury, since it was already so big at Mercury, or maybe this, whatever initiation mechanism occurred, created this very, very long duration scene. But so again, this idea that size and expansion are related doesn't seem to be the case here. We can even go a tiny bit deeper into the weeds and look at uh, how does the magnetic field scales between Mercury and uh, 1 AU? And so I'm showing it here where uh, the black curve is a uh, measurement at wind scaled to uh, the measurement at messenger. And if we use the same scaling for all components, the scaling of minus 1.6, which is the one we found for the uh, maximum magnetic field, each component match very well. Actually, it's not what you expect. What you expect from a flux loop is that the polyol field and the azimuthal field will scale differently. One has minus one, r to minus one, and the other r to minus two. That's pretty too small to see, but if you look at these different IDs based on uh, the orientation, where well, we try to fit uh, one of the parameters, scale on the parameters, r to minus one and the other minus two, it doesn't fit as well. So all the this seems to be soft similar, everything seems to be explained very well. When you get the component, the fact that you have to scale them with the same amount is not consistent with uh, quasi-steady force-free expansion of a highly twisted flux flow. Uh, before kind of moving in a bit more into the comparison section, I have just to say that uh, obviously we have more events to come although it will take a long time to reach this number of events that we have had with Mercury, uh, with Messenger and Venus Express. We now have Sol Orbiter and Planck Solar Probe. In fact, the first uh, CME observed by Sol Orbiter already showed kind of this complexity of both the sheath formation and the expansion. Uh, you can read about it. It's a paper on archive by Emma Davis, uh, which I think should be published in ANA very soon. And the basic idea is that uh, Sol Orbiter was uh, very well aligned with Earth and slightly upstream but uh, the magnetic field 
strength between Sol orbiter and Earth is pretty much the same. So this tells you that from point eight AU to one AU, the city should not have expanded, even though they get perfect alignment, which is very problematic. Tells us that you know even if we maybe understand the expansion of CME on, on large scale on 0.5 to 1 AU, we might not understand very well what's happening at scales of 0.1 to 0.2 AU. Which you know uh, reason why among others I'm trying to push for a multi-spacecraft missions dedicated to quantum mass ejection and solving structures that will provide this kind of conjunction not just fortuitously when solar orbiter happens to pass by Earth or stairway comes back to Earth in uh, one year, but uh, in a way that is meant specifically for studying CMEs and CRRs and shocks. So I uh, read this paper, it's very interesting studies with solar orbiter. So a few things about comparing the different approaches. Uh, as I said, there hasn't been really a full on study comparing all these four approaches, uh, but there's been a very nice study by Brian Wood comparing the size based on remote observation, which I called the a versus the size uh, or expansion obtained from in-situ measurement. Uh, they actually did this for pretty much all the CMEs impacting wind uh, and were observed by stereo A in a good enough way. Uh, they use a model that, uh, if you don't know, well, you look at Brian Wood's paper, but the idea is that it's the uh, visual fitting to a bifractal shape to the CME. And it also worked extremely well to uh, understand how the CME speed. So the speed, uh, which really is kind of forecasted by this model, matched extremely well with the in-situ speed measured at 1 AU. However, what doesn't match well at all is the CME size. The CME size was about three times larger from this model compared to what is observed. So really there's something we don't get well from remote sensing observation about the CME size. Uh, and in fact, this might be related to the fact that the expansion was not so similar. So if you expect soft similar expansion, we'd expect that uh, the acceleration of CME behave in a certain way, like the acceleration of the size, um, where in fact, in certain way being this, uh, as, this uh, stars, where in fact the actual data has pretty much no relationship. So it tells you that the model, which I think is soft similar in this case, they could uh, get away from soft similar, but not for 30 CMEs, it's too many free parameters. It tells you that uh, there's no self similar expansion, at least in the remote sensing images. And again, it tells us that we don't really understand well how expansion is going on. So when I'm talking about global, I show this example of the uh, July 2013 event. And in fact, uh, we start with an event that we can actually do statistics of global. Uh, so we can combine the statistical way where we try to see multiple CME at multiple distances, but in fact now do it for individual events measured at two distances. Actually, it was started back uh, in 2007 by uh, Leitner with a few events, I think seven or eight, uh, measured by Helios, uh, Ulysses, and I think Voyagers, um, where they looked at automatic field decreases with distance. Uh, more recently, Simon Good had a list of, I think, about 20 uh, chroma ejection measured uh, between Genesis Express uh, Messenger and 1EU. A very good conjunction, uh, 15 degrees or so or less. Uh, and uh, Bojan Vznak also recently published a paper where they looked at, again, uh, some of the Helios data and so on, uh, but it doesn't see any. Uh, Tarek Sandman, my graduate student, actually just published a list of 45 CMEs, uh, pretty much over source cycle 24, measured between Mercury. Uh, Venus and Earth and stereo. I oh, relaxed a bit uh, the criteria of Simon Good. Uh, instead of doing 15 or so degree, we relaxed it to about uh, 25 or so, which gives us this 45 uh, events. Uh, first thing you can see here, it's actually showing the magnetic field decrease with distance, where um, this green curve is kind of the statistical result. So it decreases distance R to minus 1.9 very consistent with three studies. But you can see here, um, each dot which is connected represents the same event, which is also what uh, Simon Good did here. And you can see that there's events that significantly deviate from the average trend. How much uh, is what we're going to look at now? Um, we actually performed the analysis of this 45 connection event. Uh, and what we found that 
if you look point by point, we take the average of all these points and compare this with the average trend, we find it's about uh, minus 1.7, so decent match with minus 1.9, uh, but with a large amount of deviation. And in fact, only less than half of the event are uh, within uh, kind of the, the uh, values that you expect. So many events deviate from it. Uh, and so we went a bit further and actually because you have one new measurement, we're able to calculate the zeta function of uh, Gleason, Demona, and Dasso and compare it with the chrysomatic field and try to compare this with the initial speed, the cinematic field and so on and so forth. What we found is that uh, there's not really good match between this global expansion, so how much the magnetic field decreases with distance, and the local expansion, whether you look at the expansion speed, the zeta parameter, or even the size. So what you measure at 1U doesn't really tell you what's happening between the sun and 1U, which is kind of problematic. Um, it's kind of what summarizes in this picture, uh, which is if you take two CMEs, maybe one with very strong magnetic field and one with weaker magnetic field uh, at uh, a bit before Mercury, uh, the one with strong magnetic field might expand rapidly, so that by the time they reach uh, Venus or close to Earth, they will have actually about the same magnetic field. And then what you measure at Earth is maybe expansion that happened in the recent past, not expansion that happened in the past two days. So you will think these two CME are expanding the same way, or in fact, they have expanded close to the sun very differently. And so now they look the same, but they didn't used to be the same. And actually some evidence to that, uh, that uh, CME uh, have become more uniform as you see them because of the Earth compared to the sun in terms of what is the maximum magnetic field and so on and so forth. What does it matter? Uh, what does expansion matter? One thing I didn't mention that really relates to my topic is that expansion uh, in the study we did in 2017 uh, has been found to be able to create shocks of CME. So some CME like this one are slow enough that they should not be driving a shock. And in fact, the CME, if you look at its average speed, is pretty much the same as a solar wind speed. So the CME is just expanding inside the solar wind, be convected to it, but it's expanding fast enough to driving a shock. Um, not a strong shock, but a shock nonetheless, which adds some, you know, uh, DBDT or geo, uh, geometric induced currents measure uh, in high latitude. In that case, it's a pretty fast expanding CME. Uh, so this kind of is a segue to the expansion, uh, or to the schist region, I'm sorry. Uh, so CME schist region, why we care about it, I mentioned it's really because it's iosomatic pressure, because we don't understand it well, and also because uh, there's automatic fluctuation in it, which be able to give rise to ultra low frequency waves in the metosphere and create all this effect on the radiation belt. Uh, she's by themselves uh, can be very effective. You can listen to my other talk uh, about this. Uh, and they're really the most poorly simulating part of the scene um, using MHD because uh, she's is really not an MHD regime. Uh, Emilia Kilpro and our group have done a lot of study about she, so uh, there's a living review in solar physics. Uh, also, very recent work, I'm showing a few here, looking at a lot of it about the fluctuation, also different spacecraft measures and sheaths. So let's go back a bit more about the physics of the sheath formation. Sadly, that most work about the semi sheath are based on analogy with planetary matter sheath. Uh, however, semi expand and propagate, whereas really uh, metosphere only due to the propagation of solar wind. There's no expansion in it. Uh, in addition, the typical Mach number in the CME is only 1.5 to 2 which would be a very low, unusual Mach number for uh, any planetary industry, especially Earth. Uh, There's only one work kind of looked at this in a kind of theoretical way, which is a work by Cisco and Austria, where again, they try to explain how the fact that it's expand is gonna create very different sheaths to planetary matter sheaths. But a lot of the work done in the corona, for example, is assuming this hydrostatic um, matter sheath regime. So uh, three points about sheath. First, that sheath can form without shocks. And that's really the accumulation. Uh, in the second paper in 2020, Drake Salman and I and others looked at pretty much all the CME measured by stereo in the past uh, 12, 13 years. And statistically, about one quarter don't have any sheath at all. 
55% of shocks, but no sheaths, uh, shocks and sheaths, I'm sorry, about half of shocks and sheaths, and 20% of sheaths, but no shock. Um, and here is kind of superposed the book analysis of uh, on the left, CME with shock and sheaths, and on the right, uh, CME without shock, but with a sheath. Uh, the same scale showing the magnetic field, the magnetic field fluctuations, velocity, density, temperature, and uh, dynamic pressure. You can see that uh, you get lower density, lower magnetic field strength, but still something looks very much like a sheath, even though it doesn't start with a shock. Uh, why, which type of CME gives you to this? Um, she's without shocks, typically relatively slow CMEs. And what we looked at is actually looking at the pseudo Mach number, because this is not a shock, so it's not really Mach number, but looking at the CME front speed uh, in the solar wind frame divided by the fast wind speed in the uh, solar wind just of upstream of the CME. Uh, and we find that you know this uh, category two CMEs, red ones, happen uh, typically at low Mach number, uh, but actually happen uh, for a large variety of uh, Mach number, which is predominantly as those around zero to one. Go we'll back to this in a second. Um, just to mention that, again, trying to combine remote sensing and, and in situ measurement, uh, a very well known event of CME with a sheath but without a shock is the December 2008 event that everyone studied, uh, but in work by Kirk DeForest and Tim Howard, uh, they kind of looked. Uh, through all the images of your search major and kind of deduce that part of the sheath is pile-up mass from the solar wind, but part of the sheath actually is starting already in the corona, very low down. And so there's no reason that would not happen for pretty much sheath due to shocks, that you still have part of the sheath that is already starting very, very close to the sun and is not due to the shock. So one thing so that sheaths can form without shocks, so that they might have different way of forming in different relation to the semi properties. One other way that we describe uh, about this very slow thing is that part of the sheath formation is due to some expansion. That's really what makes them unique and different from planetary nature sheath. Um, and the, we can do look at here is trying to look at again other fake Mach numbers. Uh, one is the propagation Mach number, which would be what is the center speed in the solar wind frame. And one would be the uh, expansion Mach number. The typo here should be expansion, um, which is what is the expansion speed of solar frame. What we find is that for typical CME measured by stereo, about the expansion contributes to about 25 to 30 percent to the total Mach number. So it's not like expansion is driving the sheets, but it's also not negligible. And with the key question uh, on how much expansion matters uh, comes from how fast does the expansion speed decrease versus the fast magnetic speed? And there's really been one simulation as I know of from um, Stefan Putz at all from 16 looking at these. Uh, and I think that's something we should all investigate a bit more. Uh, so comparing sheaths of semi, which are mostly purely uh, due to propagation, so semi that are not expanding much versus semi which are operating much are just propagating in solar wind and not expanding, we find that they're quite different. Uh, contrary to what Cisco uh, and Austral predicted based on simulation, we actually find the opposite. We find the size of this expanding sheath, uh, CME, expanding CME have larger sheaths than those that are just propagating. Uh, and on the other hand, the ones which are uh, propagating have uh, stronger magnetic field strength and stronger compression. So pretty much all of this brings us to the point that sheaths are relatively poorly understood, especially the formation. And not only the formation, but the property. Uh, a number of work very recently, a uh, group in France, and again by Derek Salman uh, in preparation, I've looked at kind of more details. Uh, I'm running out of time, but uh, Salman looked at four categories of sheaths based on speed profile. CME with a flat speed, uh, in the sheath and increasing speed in the sheath and decreasing speed or just a random speed. And the find is that uh, this different speed profile actually are pretty well correlated with two things, which is an uh, ejecta magnetic field 
and the pseudo Mach number, so the speed of the CMA in the solving frame divided by the Michelson speed. Uh, so that, for example, uh, relatively weak CME are associated with a uh, flat profile, as you can see from here, where our uh, faster CME actually associated with uh, increasing profile. Uh, and so that's still works in progress, but it can tell you that the way the sheath is formed and the property will uh, depend quite strongly on the ejecta in a way that we haven't really fully understood beyond big statistical studies. So as a conclusion, uh, I emphasize really seeing expansion and sheath formation because they are, in my opinion, two of the most poorly and fundamental questions in interplanetary physics, large scale studies. Uh, we have been blessed in the past 15 years by having planetary missions at Mercury and Venus, and now having solar probe and solar orbiter. Uh, we have enough events to compare, uh, to have conjunction and do statistical of conjunction. Um, and we can compare the local expansion, so how much is the speed decrease with the global expansion, how much did the scene increase in size or its magnetic field decrease between two points. And so far, it's no good match. It tells me that uh, the expansion of 1EU is probably mostly decoupled from what happened in the past. Uh, there's been enough work trying to compare all these four different ways explained to uh, get expansion. And I think it's very important, especially uh, this latest work with a solar orbiter, uh, that we don't really understand well how expansion happens on maybe medium scale of uh, 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 AU uh, to 1 AU. So uh, in this five to 10 hours before seeing the Earth, which would be very important if you want to develop forecasting of seeing property from uh, solar one monitors. The sheaths themselves are complex and important. Uh, we see slow CMEs that drive sheaths without shocks. We saw some slightly faster, but again, slow CMEs that are just propagating in solar wind, convected with it and expand. Uh, and driver sheaths and a shock purely due to the expansion. And in fact, probably most of the sheaths at 1EU of CME is actually a combination of uh, coronal plasma that have been swept up very early on, has been carried all the way to 1EU, uh, and then plasma that accumulated before the shock form. And then part of it is due to the uh, expansion of CME and the deflection around the ejecta. And part of it is just due to a typical shock, shocking the um, solar wind plasma. Thank you for attending this talk. I enjoy COSPAR. Uh, thank you to my funding agencies and, of course, all my co authors, uh, students, and postdocs. Um, sorry if I didn't mention your work. I tried to be relatively comprehensive and run out of time, but um, please send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you.